Welcome to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Puwadi. Later in the show, Evaner Scott will tell us about diversity, equity, and inclusion at Honor Health. And we'll learn about Hawan LLC, a Navajo-owned consulting company with Stanford Lake. In the studio with me is Dr. Jeffrey Reynoso, who serves as a regional director at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where he advances the administration's health and human services priorities. Hello, Dr. Reynoso. It's an honor to have you on our show today. Gracias. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here on Native American Heritage Month. Yes, absolutely. And before we get started, please tell us about yourself, your journey, and your background. Sure. Uh, I'm originally from California. Uh, my parents immigrated from Mexico um, in search of economic and educational opportunity. So I'm, as they say, first generation um, in this country. Um, I grew up in different parts of California, uh, but primarily the Central Valley, which is kind of that agricultural region of California and uh, inland San Diego County. Oh, wow, that is so awesome. And it's a pleasure to have you today. Um, so tell us, how did you get interested in public health and health policy? Yeah, you know, I think my first uh, interaction with public health was through medicine, right? Um, mm -hmm. My interest in medicine started at a young age, um, around middle school and high school. I had to be a caretaker for my older brother uh, who has a disability um, and my mom who uh, went through a breast cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So being you know, the seven immigrants, you have to, have to play the role of interpreter, um, health navigator and health advocate for my family uh, so that they receive the care that they needed and deserved. Uh, but it was really until uh, my third year of undergrad where I took a public health course um, in Latino health uh, at UCLA where I learned what public health was. I learned the language of social and economic determinants of health um, and how health policy um, impacts um, service delivery. So that really sparked a passion um, in me for public health and I really haven't looked back since. Oh, wow. That is so amazing to hear your journey. Um, and can you tell us about your current role? Tell us what a regional director of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is and why is what you do important? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, so I have the honor uh, to be part of the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, and I'd like to say that um, I joined the administration because it's the most diverse mm -hmm. administration in history. And we have um, people of all backgrounds um, uh, representing um, at uh, our highest levels of government. Um, as regional director, what that means is that I'm the key representative for the U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary, uh, who currently is Javier Becerra. Um, and I'm really proud that he's also the first um, Latino HHS mm -hmm. secretary in, in, in U.S. history. And I re I'm the key representative uh, with our state, local, territorial, tribal, and external partners uh, in Region 9. Uh, so I get to interact um, with a lot of different types of organizations and communities. Um, the secretary often likes to say at HHS, we're not waiting for the American people to come to us, but we're going directly to the American people. Oh, yes, definitely. And you mentioned Region 9. Where is Region 9? Yeah, before this job, I didn't really know what Region <laughs> 9 was. <laughs> so it's a great question. Uh, Region 9 uh, spans multiple states. Uh -huh. um, it includes Arizona, uh, California, Nevada, Hawaii, and the U.S. affiliated Pacific uh, Islands. Uh, and very importantly, um, within Region 9, there are 157 federally recognized tribes, um, including the 22 federally recognized tribes here in Arizona. Uh, so that means that I spend a lot of time in hotel rooms and airplanes <laughs> and in rental cars um, traveling my region. Um, but I think it's the most rewarding part of my job uh, is that I can uh, be locally in communities and uh, interface with a lot of different types of folks and understand how our federal um, health and human services mm -hmm. policies are actually being implemented on the ground and what are the gaps um, and bringing those um, perspectives back to Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Oh, wow. And what influenced or encouraged you to take on a regional director role? 
So I, I would say two things influenced me to take on the regional director role. Um, it was really hard for me to um, actually leave my prior um, job. Um, I, I had the privilege of serving as a executive director of a statewide ad health advocacy organization, um, advocating for my community for uh, Latino health. And I, I really enjoyed the work that I, that I did there, was really proud of the work that I did there. Uh, but I also have always had um, a passion for public service. Mm -hmm. uh, um, actually, when I was in, in high school, um, I was seeing the inequities and in education funding um, in my local school district. So I decided to um, run for the student seat on school board. Mm -hmm. um, so from a really young age, I was really just got this public service bug. Um, after <laughs> undergrad, um, I served a year as an AmeriCorps member mm -hmm. at a federally qualified health center um, in East LA. Mm -hmm. Um, serving um, primarily uh, Latino immigrant communities um, as a health educator. Uh, so, you know, I think I would say the opportunity to serve um, the public, serve the people's health, um, is just something that um, is innate in me. And, and so the opportunity to serve for this administration, uh, when the opportunity presented itself, I definitely jumped at the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, um, and the second reason that's very personal to me, is that there are not a lot of folks um, who come from the background that I came from that are in uh, high levels in government. So I felt it like it was almost like a responsibility that mm -hmm. if um, if I could do this job and you know I'd like to say that I'm doing it pretty well. Um, if I, I could um, be a regional director for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, that um, I should be in the, in that role um, to bring in my lived experience and my um, passion um, for health equity, um, so that you know I can be that voice um, within government and within the system mm -hmm. to um, uplift um, communities that have been marginalized, that have been um, not served or misserved by government, um, and try to improve conditions um, uh, to advance public health and wellness for all. Oh, wow, that is so amazing. You are doing such an amazing um, impact for the community and also an inspiration for the community as well to see themselves like they, I can be there one day serving Definitely. serving everyone. Um, so what are the biggest challenges you are currently facing at HHS and how are you addressing the challenges? Many, many challenges. <laughs> uh, you know, we're a large agency. Mm -hmm. uh, we have... Uh, something like 90,000 employees across the country. Yeah. Um, HHS is um, a large agency that includes um, many staff and operating divisions. Mm -hmm. So um, many um, may be familiar with um, IHS, the Indian Health Service. Um, we also have HRSA, our Health Resources and Services mm -hmm. Administration that funds um, many of the community health centers and uh, loan repayment programs for mm -hmm. physicians and nurses and other type of providers. Um, CMS is our centers for uh, Medicare, Medicaid services. So if you have Medicaid or here in Arizona access, um, or if you're on Medicare, um, everything, um, all of those programs are within CMS, but we also have FDA and, and CDC. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, various agencies and departments. Um, in terms of our priorities right now as a department, there's a few, so I'll quickly run through mm -hmm. uh, some of these and, and, and the work that we're focusing on um, currently. The first is Medicaid uh, renewal. So you may be familiar that um, during the public health emergency, there were some ex extra financial incentives um, for states to pause the regular um, annual renewal process for um, for Medicaid here in Arizona known as access. Um, so we're getting the word out that uh, Medicaid renewals are happening again. They're restarting with the end of the um, PHE and ensuring that um, no one who's eligible for access or uh, or the Children's Health Insurance Program or Kids Care mm -hmm. um, lose coverage and every, everyone who's eligible and, and wants to participate in that program is enrolled. Um, the second um, priority that's related to health care access is actually today, um, um, uh, on November 1st, uh, we are launching our open enrollment period mm -hmm. for the Affordable Care Act marketplace. So for those that um, don't qualify for access um, because your income's a little bit higher. Um, there's affordable plans on the Affordable Care Act exchange on healthcare.gov. 
And under um, the President's Inflation Reduction Act, there was actually an expansion of financial help um, to help pay for some of those premiums. Uh, and so um, we really are encouraging and trying to get the word out uh, that if you don't qualify for access, look um, for health insurance plan um, under healthcare.gov. Another priority that we hear a lot about um, as I travel in the region and as I travel in the region with the secretary is around um, behavioral and mental health. Um, it's a really big priority for for the administration. Um, we launched um, uh, last summer the 988 Lifeline. Mm -hmm. um, so this is part of the administration's comprehensive strategy um, to address the nation's mental health crisis. So far, we've invested over $1 billion um, in 988, so it's a huge number. Um, since its launch last summer, um, the Mental Health um, Crisis Lifeline has had over 5.5 million calls, texts, and chats, so it's a big number, but it just shows just the need out there. And we also understand that behavioral health, it's really important to have um, services that are in your language and in your culture. Um, so we launched, for example, the 988 um, chat and text feature in Spanish just a few months ago. And we've also invested um, over $17 million in cooperative agreements with federally recognized Indian tribes, tribal organizations, and urban Indian organizations um, to improve response, ensure access to culturally competent 988 crisis center support, and improve integration and support to ensure that there's navigation and follow up. Um, and then kind of the, the last, just to wrap it up, um, priority that we're really focusing on is health workforce. Mm -hmm. So um, during the pandemic, you know, I think that a lot of the challenges that were probably there before the pandemic around um, recruitment and retention and career laddering within the workforce were really exacerbated. Um, there was a lot of burnout. Um, and so at HHS, uh, we launched uh, this summer the HHS Health Workforce Initiative. So the secretary launched this initiative. And what we're doing is looking at a whole of HHS approach to addressing health workforce. And we're really focused on diversifying um, the health workforce okay. and ensuring that our health workforce is more reflective mm -hmm. of communities that they serve. Um, as we know that if you come from a community, um, you're more likely to go back um, and serve um, that community. And so we're doing this through a couple of different strategies from um, expanding the National Health Service Corps for providers that train um, and um, provide care in um, underserved and rural communities. And we're also investing in the Nursing Workforce Diversity Program. And this is to um, support uh, uh, folks that come from disadvantaged backgrounds to become registered nurses. So that's just a little bit of like the breadth and then the scope of the work that we do at HHS. Oh, wow, that is amazing. And how does a regional director w work with indigenous peoples? What have been some of the successes? Yeah, great question. So in terms of um, my office, so I sit within the office of the secretary and uh, our office is called Intergovernmental and External Affairs. And that's really important because within, um, we call it IEA. Within IEA, we have a tribal affairs team. And this tribal affairs team was actually established in 2000. And that team, um, my colleagues, they serve as the official first point of contact for tribes, tribal governments, and tribal organizations that want to access um, HHS. Um, so, you know, I think um, that's kind of the the front door mm -hmm. um, for um, Indian country um, at HHS. Um, and our office of IEA also confers directly with urban Indian health organizations to understand the unique, unique needs of urban Indians in accessing high quality, culturally tailored health care and social services. But also importantly, uh, we have what is called tribal consultation mm -hmm. at HHS. Um, historically with HHS, the department um, has had a department-wide tribal consultation policy that's been in place since 2005. And it, this policy was developed jointly with tribes um, to advance the nation-to-nation -nation relationship under Executive Order 13175 on consultation and coordination with Indian tribal governments. Um, some news that came out of um, a lot of work um, this year, including the Secretary's Tribal Advisory Committee, 
this September, Secretary Becerra signed the new HHS tribal consultation policy um, when he met with tribal leaders um, in Indian country. Um, this policy fortifies our political nation-to-nation relationship with tribal governments. It also introduces new innovative avenues for us to cooperate in bolstering the health and well-being of tribal communities, so really a true partnership. Um, and this policy um, provides an update uh, and advances the administration's prioritization of strengthening the nation-to-nation relationship under the President's Memorandum on Uniform Standards for Tribal Consultation, which were issued in 2021 and 2022. Um, overall, I think what this does is it represents um, HHS continued commitment to honoring the nation-to-nation relationship. But you know, in terms of the work of um, that we've done with Indian Country, there have been a number of successes. You know, I, I know when I'm out in the field, I, I often hear all of the all of the issues that are that are happening, and you know, for for good reason, we need to address those. But there's been some good progress mm-hmm. um, as it relates to um, things that we can celebrate. Um, first, um, it's vital to recognize the invaluable contributions that Native Americans have made, especially under this um, um, Native American History Month. And that includes with our workforce, there's actually over 10,000 HHS employees of Native American ancestry at HHS. So that's a a sizable number. um, And it's thanks to their hard work, their influence and their commitment to their communities that we're able to inform the work that we do at HHS. Um, Some of the wins that we've had in the last couple of years under this administration, uh, we were able to secure what is called a historic advance appropriations mm-hmm. for the Indian Health Service for IHS beginning fiscal year 2024. So what this means is that IHS is now shielded, fr- shielded from budgetary uncertainties, mm-hmm. um, and that ensures that the approximately 2.5 million American Indians and Alaska Natives mm-hmm. that uh, annually receive care, that that care is consistent. You might have heard um, all of the uh, battles in Congress around budget um, and uh, uh, continued resolutions, and really because we were able to advance events appropriations, uh, uh, it's not going to impact um, operations at Indian Health Service. So that's really critically important um, because we know that these are life and death um, situations. Um, and then um, I'll just um, also share that this secretary is committed um, to advancing um, Indian Health. Um, this, this actually later this month, we will inaugurate the Hall of Tribal Nations at our HHS headquarters in Washington D.C. at the Hubert Humphrey Building. Um, this emblematic hall will probably showcase the department's commitment to tribes by displaying the flags of the tribal nations that make up the Secretary's Tribal Advisory mm-hmm. Committee at HHS. Um, so this was led by the Native American employees at HHS, um, and this is the f- first department to establish a secretarial level tribal advisory committee back in 2010. So there's a lot to be proud of, but a lot of work ahead. Oh yes, that's definitely true and so amazing. Um, so Dr. Reynoso, what is your day-to-day schedule like? <laughs> that is a great question. I can't tell you what a typical day is like because it, it feels like um, every day is a little bit different. Um, but you know, I think I'll, I'll share that um, I kind of have my days um, out in the field and then I have my office days. So my my office days are, you know, kind of your regular um, log into Zoom or, you know, when I go into the um, HHS headquarters um, in, in San Francisco, um, really just catching up on the latest developments and updates from HHS across our staff and operating divisions and just ensuring that I have all the information that I need so mm-hmm. that um, I'm well um, versed in, in the topics and the issues that that we're covering as I go out into the field. Um, externally, um, when, when I do travel, um, it's an opportunity, you know, I start really early and usually end pretty late, mm-hmm. um, but it's meeting with, you know, um, community-based organizations, federally qualified health centers, hospitals, um, really meeting with key leaders in the community to mm-hmm. um, understand um, how their programs are serving various communities and um, what continued challenges and, and feedback I need to take back um, to D.C. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, Dr. Reynoso, how can our listeners find more information about HHS 
and how or who can they contact um, if they wanted to get in contact with your office? Yeah, so there's a couple of different uh, resources that I want to plug here. Um, if it's specifically related to any health service um, and, and tribal issues, we have a tribal affairs uh, email. So mm-hmm. you can email tribalaffairs at hhs.gov. Uh, if you're looking for low cost insurance, I mentioned healthcare.gov yes. earlier. Uh, sometimes those those forms and insurance can be very complicated so i really encourage folks to also look for enrollment and sisters mm-hmm. in their local community and one of the best places to go is at a health center um, mm-hmm. like um, native health um, you can look for your um, closest health center at findahealthcenter.hrsa.hrsa.gov um, also um, if you're looking for mental health support um, we also have findsupport.gov uh, so those are a couple of the resources that we have at hhs Perfect. Well, I would like to thank you, Dr. Reynoso, for coming in today. You gave us a lot of great information today, and we really appreciate your time. Great. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we'll learn about diversity, equity, and inclusion at Honor Health with Evaner Scott. Support for KRDP 90.7 FM comes in part from Native Health with two locations in Phoenix, 4041 North Central Avenue, Building C, near the corner of Central Avenue and Indian School Road, and at 2423 West Dunlap Avenue. Native Health is also located in Mesa at 777 West Southern Avenue, near the corner of Southern Avenue and Extension Road. Native Health provides primary medical, dental, behavioral health, WIC, and wellness services for the urban Native American community. For more information, call 602 279-5262 or visit our webpage at nativehealthphoenix.org. Welcome back to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Pawati. In the studio with me is Evaner Scott, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Honor Health. Hello, Evaner. It's an honor to have you on our show today. Thank you. Thanks for thank you for inviting me. Of course. And before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? your journey and background? Yeah, you bet. Um, As stated, my name is Evaner Scott. Uh, Evaner is a family name, so that name was passed down to me, but I come from the Diné Nation up in the northern part of Arizona. I am Kia'ani. I guess uh, Navajo Nidruk introduction would make sense. (laughs) Kia'ani Nishle. But Atni Bashashin, Ashin Dashichedo, Tlashchi Dashinale. So I'm of the Towering House People clan. Born for the Folding Arms uh, People Clan, the Salt People Clan are my, my maternal grandfathers, and my um, the Red Bottom People are my mat- paternal grandpa- grandfathers. So I come from an uh, area up there called, uh, we call it Chesentra, mm-hmm. or Nittendeitin is what they kind of talk about as well. It's called Tisto. It's just about 40 miles uh, north of Winslow. And I was born and raised up there, and I moved down here to Phoenix back in 1987. So I've been down here since. Oh, wow. That is so awesome. And uh, t- going diving into DEI, can you tell us about the, about the programs um, you do at Honor Health, and why is it important? Well, one thing we, uh, I, I like to stress about diversity, equity, inclusion uh, work is it's not a program. Mm-hmm. Um, Diversity, equity, inclusion should be embedded in everything we do as an organization. In life, you know, it's just not about a company or an organization. I think it's really about um, understanding and really grasping and acknowledging that people are different. That's the diversity part. It's a fact. And that um, we're all in this world trying to make our way and trying to be um, fair and equitable. 
that's what it's about. You know, it's about fairness and how we treat each other. And then, well, you know, what COVID taught us is the idea that we got so disconnected during that time. We were all social beings. We need to be included and we need have, to have our voice heard. So that's the inclusive part of it. Mm-hmm. That's the DE and I. And the outcome of that is really a sense of belonging. So that's really the work I'm doing um, currently at Honor Health is really trying to foster a culture where people where people's background, their diversity is acknowledged and that they're treated fairly and that they're um, being included. Their voice is heard, so they have a sense of belonging. So it's that sense of home. They feel like they belong and they feel like they're cared for. And what influenced or encouraged you to take on this DEI director role? That's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, as I reflect on this work, I've, my entire career has been in, involved with training and development, education, training and development, and more more recently in the past decade or so, uh, leadership development, doing culture work. And um, in hindsight now, as I really look at diversity, equity, inclusion, and the work that surrounds that, I've been doing it all along, you know, because if you look at leadership development, leadership development, if you really want a good, be a good, um, capable leader, and you're leading a team of individuals, you got to recognize they're, they're all different. They all have different talents, different strengths, and they have different communication styles. So that's diversity work. Um, so it was just a natural move for me, I think, moving into this work because it's an extension. I like to say that it's leadership development at a higher level. Mm-hmm. You know, And when I say leadership, it's not just people leadership as far as a formal leadership. It's everyone that's self-leadership. So everyone in an organization has the capability to lead and influence people and demonstrate diversity, equity, inclusive type of uh, diversity, equitable and inclusive type of behaviors. So that's kind of how I equate it and how I moved into this role. And it was just kind of a natural fit for me. Mm-hmm. And what exactly does it cover? It covers um, the full gamut of the workplace. Mm-hmm. You know, it's how we're looking to attract and recruit people, you know, into the workplace. It's we got to recognize, I mean, you can look at it from diversity has its has its foundation in social justice and, um, you know, civil rights. So you can approach diversity from the standpoint of I want to hire more people of color, Mm -hmm. you know, marginalized people. I want to bring in people like that. And a lot of times it's about organizations and the the organization or, or communities they serve. It's about representation. It's like for, like in healthcare, if we're serving a population that is mainly people of color, mm-hmm. you know, it helps when you have people of color who are doing the caregiving. It's like that for any, any industry. So that's one aspect of it, I think. Um, so it's in recruitment. It's also just in when you do have people on board. You know, most people, they want to grow and develop within their organizations. So it's how you meet them where they are and recognize their strengths uh, recognize their opportunities, otherwise, you know, otherwise call weaknesses, and learn to develop them and help them get involved in that. So that's being inclusive. Um, and then it's also in maybe who you're targeting to serve. You know, um, you know, when you're in healthcare, you have a hospital or you have locations, um, practices, medical centers, uh, medical practices, and you look have to look at the population you serve and you have to recognize that you got to do all you can to meet their needs where they are. So it's that, what I like to call interpersonal savvy, you know, if at an individual level, you know, a patient comes in, a customer comes in um, to your store, any place, it's meeting them where they are. So it's kind of embedded in every aspect of the work we do. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, particularly, it's uh, a lot of my work is focused on internally about building our 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 human capital from the standpoint of our workforce, and it's also about the patients we serve. So I am kind of playing supporting two roles in the work that I do right now. Oh wow! And um, have there been any challenges to your work? No, nah, it's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's there's tremendous challenge. Um, you know, just mention the word diversity to anyone out in the mm-hmm. in society. You know, it's 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 uh, politicized, it's weaponized. You know, and um, the biggest challenge I think is getting people to have a different mindset about it. 
You know, it's not always about race, gender, or sexuality. Um, it's, it's a lot of times the the true the true power in leveraging a diverse workforce is what's below the surface. Mm-hmm. It's understanding what people bring to the table their their special talents, their gifts, their strengths, and even their fears. You know, where there's opportunity, it's their mindset. It's how they communicate. So I, I think that's probably the challenge today is that everyone feels they don't have time. Mm-hmm. You have to make time. You have to stop and ask someone how they're doing. How do you, when you have an engaged, uh, a, a time of engagement talking with them, you know, maybe you're their leader and you have to ask them, how did that go? How did that feel for you? Is there something you want me to stop, start, or continue doing? Mm-hmm. You know, and that takes time to do. Today we're so uh, moving so fast and that we don't take time to do that. And then we, even with what COVID did, you know, it's getting back in person again. You know, I had a choice today of coming and doing this in person over the phone. I specifically said I want to be in person because I want to model that behavior of getting back in person. So it's just about managing our time. That's the biggest thing. I think the biggest challenge. And also, it's probably just getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of times people feel that they have to be have the right thing to say, the right way to say it, when really the other person, all they really want is for you to be and show up like a human being and be vulnerable and be open and acknowledge when you say the wrong thing, mm-hmm. you know, and just own it and then apologize and mean it <laughs> and then start over again. You know, I think that's what resonates today is people just want people to be true and authentic in how they show up. And what role do you think employee resource group play in DEI? There's a lot of organizations out there, and what I'm trying to do as well is just really leverage the spirit of uh, employee resource groups. Mm-hmm. And what the power that brings is employee resource groups. We, we call it at our organization, we call it people resource groups mm-hmm. because we want to be inclusive in our language. Um, when we say employee resource groups, there are some populations out there who maybe aren't employed by our by our company they're say oh it's for them you know people resource group is more inclusive which means we're, we're recognizing volunteers we're making recognizing individuals who are not directly employed by the by our company um, even community members so people resource groups are voluntary they're employee led or team member led and that's the power in it that's given power back to the people themselves and it really takes as well for it to really succeed as it takes executive sponsorship mm-hmm. someone has to step up and say i want to help support this group and you know the, the the power of the resource groups as well is that they can be focused on identity mm-hmm. if you have affinity or if you are um, part of this group uh, this type of identity whether it's race ethnicity um, it could be veteran status, you know, it could be a uh, physician, it could be any type of identity, you know, you could build resource groups around that. It also could be around interests. I have an interest in well-being, I have an interest in um, underwater basket weaving, let's form a group around that, right? It could be something like that. But it, that's the power of it is if you're in an organization and you can recognize and acknowledge across the, the people that they have a common interest in some type of identity or in an in, in interest in a topic. You can form groups around that and you can drive change. And that's the probably the biggest power of employee resource groups, people resource groups, is the capability they have to really drive change um, from a point, from a place that I like, people like to say bottom up. I don't like to say bottom up because mm-hmm. I look at organizations more from um, across, not top down, but they can drive uh, change from an individual contributor standpoint and they can influence people. Um, so that's the power of uh, resource groups. Oh yeah, and I definitely love the idea of people's resource group. Um, but what are a few methods you use to educate employees on DEI and the workplace? A few methods, you know, I, I, I go back to, like I said, it's just an extension of, 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 of how you help someone grow and develop. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a great example is what's your communication style? How do you prefer me to communicate to you? You know, how do you prefer to get feedback? You know, it doesn't have to come from your upline leader. Mm-hmm. It could be peer to peer. 
you know, it's being open and being inquiry based. I think that's probably the biggest um, capability people can have now is to rather than go in and tell, go in and ask. Mm -hmm. Ask good, insightful questions. You know, you know, I always like to say that empower, powerful questions result in powerful answers, you know, so if you can ask good questions. So that's a skill in itself that outside of the EI, it's, it's a great skill that the capability I think is to know what to ask and how to ask a question so that's one for sure you know and it's really people I like to say um, for a person to be open and honest and say it's okay to say I don't know I don't know this so I'm gonna ask you how you prefer this or or I don't know this I'm gonna ask you your perspective so those are simple tactics mm -hmm. you know I always like to say in my organization what I'm trying to do is make these um, this approach to developing a diverse equitable and inclusive environment where the people have a sense of belonging just making it so embarrassingly embarrassingly simple mm -hmm. and that's what it is it's getting back to the fundamentals of how you treat one another there's more strategic tactics but I think it's just starting at that level. And to me, it's all about building community. It's all about building community. And being in community means that you have that sense of belonging. Uh, when a person has that sense of belonging, they feel they're cared for, they feel respected, they feel valued. Um, that's only one part of belonging. The other part of belonging is since I feel that way, I feel I have co-ownership in this. Mm -hmm. When I feel I have co-ownership in this, I'm accountable for it and I'm gonna give discretionary effort. So that's the beauty, I think, of the community and DEI work is if you can get a person to feel that sense of belonging and that ownership, then that's a special place to be because they'll act and behave in a, a different way. That is true. You influence your, their behavior. Well, I would like to thank you, Evaner, for coming in today to tell us all of this great information about DEI. And thank you so much for sharing all of your advice and all of the great work you're doing as well. You bet. Thank you for having me. Up next, I'll chat with Stanford Lake, owner of Hawan LLC. Support for KRDP 90.7 FM comes in part from Native Health with two locations in Phoenix, 4041 North Central Avenue, Building C near the corner of Central Avenue and Indian School Road. And at 2423 West Dunlap Avenue, Native Health is also located in Mesa at 777 West Southern Avenue near the corner of Southern Avenue and Extension Road. Native Health's patient enrollment specialists can help you enroll, renew, or update your access information. This can be done in person, on the phone, or Zoom, days, nights, or weekends. It's fast, easy, and can make a difference in keeping your health care coverage. For more information, call 602-285-9492. Welcome back to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Puwadi. Stanford Lake is the owner and project manager of Hawan LLC, a Navajo-owned consulting company dedicated to empowering indigenous communities, native-owned enterprises, and advancing STEM initiatives. Hello, Sanford. It's an honor to have you on our show today. Thank you for having me on your show today. Absolutely. And before we get started, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? My name is Stanford Lake. I'm originally from Kienta, Arizona, and currently living here in Prescott Valley, Arizona. And my, I'm Dene, I'm the Navajo Nation. And my four plans, which we usually introduce, is to the Sun Slaw, Tolichini Bus's team, Kia Ani Bus's team, Kohane Bus's team, Tolichini Bus's 
So that's my introduction as a Navajo person. Sort of like our DNA uh, um, of our past history uh, of our ancestors and just like always good to always greet um, other Diné and also to the, to the world. Oh, yes. Thank you for sharing that, Stanford. And it sounds like we are closely related. I am Kintla Chitney Nishle and Twitter Chitney Bashishin. Yep, definitely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, so please tell us about Hoan LLC and its history from the start. In 2018, I was part of a ACES STEM business cohort. And in the cohort was what type of business can you start, but also it has to be related to STEM. So from that, I started a company called Hoan LLC. Uh, Hoan means the home for, for us Navajo people. So also my logo, I, what I want to incorporate in my logo was also the original dwelling of the Navajo people, which is the, the, the Hogan. And also it was more of a dedication to my late Nolly lady, she lived up to 103 years old, um, herding sheep all her life on Black Mesa, Arizona. She recently passed away like three weeks ago. So in a way, it, it comes back as a remembrance of her doing all of that. So, Oh, wow. I'm sorry about your loss, but I'm happy that you are able to remember her um, in this way. Um, Stanford, so have you always been interested in STEM at a young age before you joined the the ACES STEM cohort? I guess when I was younger, I wasn't really aware of STEM or like the science, technology, engineering, uh, mathematics, uh, all of that. I never thought about that. Um, I went through my grade school and then once I got to high school is when I started to be interested in mathematics and I was really good at that so I went to some summer enrichment class uh, co- um, programs like NAU and uh, Joni Camp and also the ASU honors math and science program so it really opened up my doors to pursue a career in engineering but also maybe in construction so Oh, wow. That sounds so amazing to get um, all those opportunities in high school that really opened up the doors to your current career. Um, But tell us about Hoan LLC. What kind of consulting services do you provide? The type of consulting service I provide mainly is project management, meaning uh, either as a designer or as a construction uh, management person is to and incorporate ideas of sort of like a a building or or maybe a roadway and try to put together the stakeholders and develop a project out of that and then along the course from the design into construction i sort of uh, i guess you can say supervise and make sure everything's implemented not only to the drawings but to code um, so that these um, structures and even roadways and things that are being constructed that they last for a long time and they're energy efficient. And then the other part of it is trying to ensure that these deliverables uh, it also honors a tribal uh, culture because uh, sometimes we don't understand and as an outsider coming back to the, to the different reservations we have to um, also research what kind of culture they have and sort of incorporate that so that we're all on the same page and we're moving towards a goal and stuff like that. So so that's the main service I got. Oh, wow. That's amazing. It sounds like your work really has a lot of different parts um, in what you do. And you mentioned about being sensitive to tribal cultures. So how do you bring an indigenous perspective into your work? Well, it starts with a lot of... Um, kickoff meeting during design phases. Sometimes I might be the only American Indian member of the design team and the rest of our um, non-native. So I sort of become that person, I guess you can call it tribal liaison, and work with the stakeholders. In this case, it would probably be a tribal department 
like Navajo Housing Authority or say the White River Indian Tribe Housing. So there's there's ways to communicate to them. And afterwards, I do get a lot of response from 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 them saying, "What what did they say?" Or what some of these languages are really difficult, like they're really too advanced. So I bring it down to them to know, let them know this is what they're talking about. So those are one areas when it comes down to the start of each project. I guess you can say trying to incorporate that there there is things that we also um, have to honor. Maybe they have taboos or there's a certain way that they function from their culture. So try to respect stuff like that. So, so I think that's the way I approach uh, my work and make sure that everyone's on the same page. Stanford, can you tell us about some of your recent projects? One of the recent projects I'm currently doing is working with the Navajo Housing Authority, a general contractor from uh, Albuquerque, and also a uh, Navajo architect from Albuquerque. And so I'm sort of on their design team, also be probably most likely doing com- construction administration during construction. So we're putting together a two-story apartment for the employees of the for the main area in Winter Rock. So we're um, moving fast along. It's a design-built project, and sorry, has a general contractor on board and the architects there. So it's it's going to be a pretty pretty fast move project. So um, I usually like to be in the, those type of situation, uh, design built, they call it, where everything's all, every party of team are there from start to finish. So that's one of my recent projects. And then probably a, another project, Navajo Nation Historic Preservation Project for the Navajo Nation Chamber, where the Navajo Nation Council members are at. And that was one of the most rewarding project I've been on. It was most one, it's one of the most difficult projects I've been on was trying to retrofit the exterior Vega log beams that are up on the upper roof. So we had to somehow remove a lot of that decay logs and replace it with new logs. And we need to match the existing logs with the existing logs. So it took a lot of advanced engineering doing that, a lot of structural 3D analysis to put that together and using the latest technology, meaning uh, AutoCAD Revit, and then just using the softwares to put that together. And then once construction started, then I was on site all the time to, to make sure that for following the drawing, that every bolt was put in place correctly. And then when they remove all the shoring from underneath, from the inside of the chamber, that it, it doesn't deflect down, I believe, a quarter inch. So that was sort of a difficult but rewarding. The rewarding side of it was uh, a year later, uh, we were invited to the Arizona State location in Phoenix, Arizona, and we, we were rewarded the Outstanding Historic Preservation Project. The Navajo Nation speaker at the time was there. Uh, the president was also invited too. So, but all in all, it was really one of the most difficult and rewarding. So that's how these projects go. Oh, wow. That sounds all very exciting and so amazing of all the work that you're doing. Um, Stanford, can you let our listeners know um, where they can find more information about Hoan LLC and how they can contact you? I have a website. It's Hoan, H-O-O-T-H-A-N, L-L-C dot com, Hoan, L-L-C dot com. And my phone number is on the website at the very bottom, and it shows that the contact, my phone number is 928-421-3813, and also my contact from my emails there, which can, which is info at home1llc.com. So, and then also I have a couple social media platforms that I'm on, like TikTok, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. So I do um, provide some areas of 
like um, sort of um, putting out um, maybe weekly things like tips and tricks of the business world, especially in the native world, like where to go, um, where to register, how to become a priority one with navigation, stuff like that. I sort of upload those information so that they have a they can succeed and move a lot faster and be out there for the people. So that's the reason why I have those social media. Oh, wow, that is so awesome. We'll definitely um, follow you there. But I would like to thank you, Stanford, for coming on air with us today to tell us all of the great work you're doing with Hawan LLC and also giving us a background and ho- on how you got there. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for listening to Native Talk Arizona, supported by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. Audio editing by Javier Quiroga, and the executive producer is Susan Levy. And I'm host Lanasha Puati. We hope you tune in again next week. If you have any questions, please email us at nativetalkaz at radiophoenix.org.